This is a talk I gave the last time I gave this, I've given it twice and it was four quest, open questions in the unbody problem. And I found out that four was too many. The, the talk, kind of, I, I think it's gonna be better to just give two. And please, I, I like a style where people are, you can interrupt if you have questions. Um, I probably, and if people are embarrassed to interrupt, Sean, maybe you could just read them if they're in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I, I like questions. So thank you, Sean, for the invite and Holger Dolan, Nathan Doignan, Daniel Rose for conversations and um, collaborators uh, include well, the collaborators for the work that I'm gonna be talking about are Nathan Doignan, who was a student of Holger, Jacques Fajos, Andreas Canal, Rick Moko, Carlos Simo Gueyu, and over the years, Alan Chansonier and Gil Bohr have been uh, essential to me continuing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start with a tour of the N-body problem, and then I'm going to, um, get into the specific problems that I have posed, the open questions. So um, 1667, Newton publishes the first version of the Principia. He states the end body problem, allegedly has headaches, trying to solve the, spends 15 years and lots of headaches trying to solve the three body problem. He solves the two body problem and thereby derives Kepler's law of planetary motions. So we're gonna start the tour with two bodies. So here are two equal masses and they're moving around ellipses with the focus, one focus at their center of mass. And um, I'm gonna write down the equations so the notation is I'm going to have the QAs are going to be the locations of the masses. Can you see the Q2 on your screen? Someone give me a thumbs up or something because I don't know what you can see and not see. Yeah? Okay, so there's a Q2 on the screen. And the R12 is the distance between ma mass one and two. If there were a third mass, that would be R13 and R23. Um, but there isn't a third mass yet. So the forces are um, equal and opposite. The, the, the magnitude of the force is one over the distance squared. There's a proportionality constant. And uh, the force of two on one, two pulls one, and one pulls two in the equal in the same way, but in the opposite direction. Here is the differential equations. Mass times acceleration is force. So M1, acceleration of M1 is force of two on one. And similarly for mass two. And by subtracting these two equations and doing a bit of algebra, you can derive this system for the difference of the two positions, the difference vector. And nowadays, I don't know the history of why, well, I can guess, but people call this Kepler's problem. Kepler never wrote down a differential equation, but the solutions yield Kepler's three laws. So that's Kepler's problem. The solutions are conics with one focus at the origin. Now the origin means the center of mass of Q1 and Q2, and the origin is moving in a straight line. So there's the, the center of mass, and you can, you can massage the differential equations and derive that the center of mass has acceleration zero, so it moves in a, celerate, in a straight line. <clears throat> Now we typically think of the two body problem in the limit where one mass is much greater than the other. So here's a picture of the sun and a planet going around. That's supposed to be an ellipse. So um, there's a planet going around the sun, but the sun has finite mass 
It does, its mass is not infinite. The sun is actually moving a little bit. Now, if you compute the size of the sun's motion, because the sun is a thousand times bigger than the combined, ma its mass is a thousand times bigger than the mass of the solar system, the sun barely moves, but it moves. It moves in such a way that the center of mass of the whole system actually lies inside the sun, the center of mass of the solar system. But it moves, and, and that motion is key to the discovery of exoplanets. So let me remind you a little bit about exoplanets. The first exoplanets discovered were what they, some, they sometimes call hot Jupiters. So these are uh, Jupiter-sized planets that are very close to the sun. So the, the Jupiter's going around, the sun's going around in the opposite way. And what we see from our telescopes on Earth, looking at this system, is we see the sun, we see its velocity. We can, you can measure that with freq frequency shift, red, you know, the red and blue shift, depending on which way it's moving. So that's called the radial velocity dispersion. That's how exoplanets were first discovered. We have, we have other ways of looking at them now, but that was the original signal for exoplanets 20 odd years ago by some Swiss astronomers. My, the second question I'm going to talk about is scattering. This is an animation uh, Gil Bohr made for me with Mathematica. So think of these as a bunch of comets coming in from infinity and scattering by Keplerian motion off the sun. This is what happens when that incoming beam scatters off the sun. We're more familiar uh, in mathematical physics Oh, I, I left it out. It has, somehow it got deleted. Rutherford scattering used to be here. It's gone now. I'll talk about that later, maybe. <clears throat> okay, I'm jumping now to the three-body problem. This is a solution found by Lagrange in 1772, where the um, three planets at every instant form equilateral triangle. The equilateral triangles rotate. The masses do not have to be equal. For any three masses, there's going to be a solution like this where the equilateral triangle spins. Here's the three body equations. Now we have three one over R squared type forces. So the, you know, the force on mass one is the force that mass two exerts and the force that mass three exerts, et cetera. So those are the ODEs. Five years before Lagrange, Euler found solutions, which at every instant are collinear. In this unanimated cartoon, uh, the two, the blue and the green mass are equal. So I can put the red mass at the center and then these guys would just move in a circle. <clears throat> but Euler showed that for any mass ratios, there's collinear solutions. So at every instant they're collinear. The ratio, the ratio this to this will depend on the masses. So we count Euler solutions as three depending on whether it's the red, blue, or green mass in the middle. So those are the, those are known solutions. Oh, I, I keep going here. It turns out that for the Euler and Lagrange solutions, you can take any Kepler conic and you can have the masses move in a Kepler conic. They're similar conics. So the, the one of the, the foci of all of them is the center of mass. And for each Kepler conic, you have a solution. So these are called the, uh, these are the ones that come from what are gonna be called central configurations. These are the only solutions we have closed form formulas for. We know existence of many others, but there's no analytic closed form formulas for any other solutions.
Um, eighteen nine here. I'm going to jump ahead now. I'm jumping ahead a hundred and twenty thirty years. This is uh, an animation of something that's essentially in Poincaré. This is what's called the restricted circular two-body problem. So the think of the blue and the red as the Earth and the Moon in a circular Keplerian orbit. So they're moving in a circle about their center of mass and I've gone into a rotating frame. So it's rotating at the rate at which the earth and moon are going around each other. And now I put a little satellite in and there's the satellite and it, it does this kind of crazy motion. This is called a transit orbit. This, is, this animation is thanks to Rick Mokel. And this is meant to illustrate what Poincaré found, which is nowadays called deterministic chaos in the three body problem. So these are, he found homoclinic tangles and people went back and looked at his work and were able to prove existence of smell horseshoes in the restricted three body problem. Here is a scattering type problem that Piet Hutt described and many other people in the 70s. So here, um, masses one and two are coming in nearly Keplerian orbit and mass three comes in and all hell breaks loose in here. And then one somehow captures three and they go off and two goes out the other way. This is called an exchange orbit. He was interested in these and a number of other astronomers because they're um, essential ingredients for understanding galactic evolution. You want to look at galactic million body or 100,000 body problems in a statistical mechanical sense. And this, these, three, these kind of exchange interactions become an essential ingredient and trying to formulate some kind of statistical mechanics. This is the uh, reason that I'm known in this game. This is called the figure eight orbit. It was discovered, as far as we know, by Chris Moore. You, you know, there's a slight chance Lagrange knew about it. I don't know. I don't know my history well enough, but as far as we know, it was discovered by Chris Moore in 1994. Alain Chansonnier and myself rediscovered it in 2000. It's a what's called KAM stable periodic orbit for three equal masses. They chase each other around a figure eight. And um, are they, oh, at every instant, this, uh, this solution has a zero angular momentum. So zero angular, I, I got obsessed by the zero angular momentum three body problem. And uh, Danya Rose under Holger Dullen wrote this uh, beautiful thesis. And there's an appendix that's just a kind of a gold mine of data. He calls it a beast theory of periodic orbit. So he has over 200 collision free, zero angular momentum, equal mass, three body solutions there. And uh, you can look at his pictures, and there's just a ton of data there that's. Um, I would say left unmined. I think there's a lot of interesting theorems and conjectures that one could uncover by burying into his, his thesis. So that's from 2016. So thank you, Holger, for working with Danya. Um, here's a few n bigger than three orbits. These are choreographies that uh, kind of came out of the figure eight. So this is from a paper of SEMO. I might be a co-author on the paper, I forget. <laughs> Anyways, this is for five bodies. So these are, in each of these solutions, the five bodies chase each other around some planar curve. Most of them, all of these ones are unstable dynamically. And here's some for n greater than five. 
this particular family exists for any odd n, we call it the chain family. So there's a whole industry around these choreographies. They tend to be unstable. That's the end of the tour. I'm about to move to the open questions. Uh, it just feels like a good way to get started with things. Um, so let me uh, thank people. I'm gonna thank Rick Mokel and Gil Bohr for the animations and Danya Rose and Carlos Simo for some of the stills. And I'm, a, I'm going to give a, two, a, a few slides now about the, th the end body problem in general, and then I'm gonna state these open questions. I'm gonna pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Okay, so here are the equations. Um, <clears throat> here, and, and this is also telling you my, my notation. I have, I have positions of masses QA and they're in RD. Typically, you know, typically we're interested in D is two and three. Turns out to be very interesting to take D equal to four also. Um, Mass times the acceleration is the force. The force on body A is the force of all the other bodies. So if here's A, if here's A, then B and C and D are all pulling it. So that's the equations. The force is like before. It's one over R squared force, where R is the distance between body B and A. And the proportionality constant is the product of the masses involved and the gravitational constant, which you need to make the units match. So um, generalities about the equations. They're a system of dn, d times n nonlinear second order ODEs, they're analytic. They have singularities at the collisions. They have a large Lie group of symmetries and associated to those symmetries, they have conservation laws. The phase space, if you want to write them as first order ODEs, the phase space is RDN minus the collision. So I'm using the symbol delta for the collisions where, the, where two of the bodies collide, two or more. So this is the positions, here are the velocities. So you can write it as a vector field in a space of dimension two times dn. Um, Galileo came before Newton. Newton was in the 16, what did I say, 1667? He was 1600s. He wrote down the, it's, it's kind of typical physics, you know the symmetry before you know the equations. Newton explicitly wrote down his equations to be invariant under the Galilean group. Here's the Galilean group. Spatial isometry, so translations and rotations. Time isometry, so time translations and time reversal. In one translation, I mean, one symmetry that mixes space and time, the Galilean boosts. And uh, Following Galileo, Newton made sure that his differential equations were such that they, if you had a solution, you apply a Galilean transformation to it, you get another solution. So here's uh, Noether. So she tells us, uh, it's I guess the 1880s or something. So that this is kind of uh, historically out of order, but for every Galilean symmetry, there's gonna be a conservation law. And if you use these, you can cut down the degrees of freedom to D times N minus one. You can turn the phase space into a phase space like this. So D times the N minus one dimensional Euclidean space minus the collisions and same with the velocities, D times N minus one. 
so this is the statement that the linear momentum is zero. You, you do that by using Galilean boosts, and then you use the translations to make sure the center of mass is at the origin. So that's the basic system. And here are the questions that I want to, when I've given another version of this talk with four questions, these are the four I looked at. So I'm gonna read them, but I'm only gonna do two. <clears throat> Is the number of central configurations finite? I haven't told, I gave you examples, but I haven't told you what a central configuration is. Are there any stable periodic solutions at all? That's a big open question. Is every braid type realized by a periodic planar solution? And is the image of the scattering map open and dense? Today, I'm just going to do one and four. Because if I try to do all four, it'll yeah, I just don't have the time. It won't be a pleasant talk for me or you. So we're going to do problem one first, and this will be a little bit sketchy. Um, I'm going to just tell you right off the bat, I have avoided this. I haven't worked on this at all. So I'm telling you about other people's work here. Uh, I would say about somewhere between a half and a third of all the published mathematical work in the last 40 years on the n-body problem is on central configurations. And I've just avoided it. But I wanna tell you what the problem is and why it's important. Okay, so um, the screen might freeze up. I'm just gonna to talk to you for a second. If you've ever taught an undergraduate dynamical systems course, you, if you use up, I'm looking at my books here, you have a Hirsch and Devaney or a Devaney book or Strogatz. And typically the first thing you do is look for equilibria. And once you find the equilibria, you linearize. There's no equilibria at all in the end body problem. You cannot have n stars just sitting in the sky because they're all attracting each other. There's no equilibria. So the next best thing to equilibria are equilibria mod the symmetry group. Those are called relative equilibria. And for n equals two with equal masses, here's an example. Um, they just move in a circle. So if two equal masses, you can just have them move in a circle. A relative equilibria exists for two bodies for any masses. They're the circular solutions to the Kepler problem. And for n equals three, those are the solutions I showed you before. Those are the solutions of Lagrange from that animation before, and the solutions of Euler, where the three, the three uh, the three bodies were in a line and then they spun around. So we have a relative equilibrium for the three body problem. And it turns out in two dimensions, relative equilibria are the same as this, these gadgets called central configurations. So here's a definition of a central configuration. So I'm gonna try to do it slowly. The central configuration is a configuration for the n-body problem. So in other words, a point in the configuration space such that when it's dropped from rest, so that means the velocity is zero, it evolves by shrinking. So the solution, when you take the initial condition, so the initial condition is Q star and velocity zero, the solution looks like this, lambda t is a scalar. So that says the bodies are just shrinking to total collision. And the theorem says that um, in two dimensions, the relative equilibria, the configurations that have relative equilibria through them are in bijection with the central configurations. 
Okay, I'm gonna have to ask Sean to show up for a second. When did I start? Uh, you started about 25 minutes ago. Okay, and the typical thing is to go 50 minutes, right? Yeah, no. Okay, good. So I am going to skip the derivation of this and I'm gonna kind of skip right to the end of this business. I will, um, because of Galilean symmetry and because the, homo the potential is homogeneous, if you have one central configuration, you have a whole group orbit of them. If you have a central configuration, any rotation, translation, or scaling of it is also a central configuration. So when you're counting them, you do not want to count them as, as individual central configurations. You want to count the orbits. So this first question, the question is, how many similarity classes of central configurations are there? For n equals three, for the three body problem, Euler and Lagrange found them all. They were the, the two solutions of Lagrange. We count them as different because we're going to only, we're only gonna use a group of orientation preserving isometries. We're not gonna um, allow reflections. So depending on the order in the plane you get two different equilateral triangles. So we have the two equilateral triangles of Lagrange and the three of Euler. And um, so again, the question is the number of central configurations finite. <clears throat> A little bit of history of the problem. This is essentially stolen from our historian. Alain Bouy is a great historian of the end body problem. Shazia in 1918 asked this question. Wintner expounded on it and referenced Shazia. Smale popularized it in the 1970s. He had this, this, two volume, this two paper series called Topology and Mechanics, which was pre foundations of mechanics. And it was a basic part of his uh, program. And then again in 2000, in answer to Hilbert's problems, he published at the behest of Arnold, mathematical problems for the next century. And this is problem six of his problems for the next century. The problem again is the number of central configurations finite. So six years after Smale asked it, Mokel and Hampton answered it for n equals four. So for four bodies in the plane. So we know the answer is finite. For n equals five, six years after Mokel and Hampton, Albui and Colossian almost solved the problem. They said that for five bodies away from a certain algebraic hypersurface, so there's a polynomial in the in m1 through m5 and if you have polynomial not equal to zero for the masses then you can guarantee that there's a finite number it's still open what happens if you're on that algebraic hypersurface and for n equals six nobody knows so the problem is totally open for n equals six the planar, the planar two body, planar, planar six body problem, problems totally open. Um, a little bit about the problem. I'm just gonna talk about the uh, three body problem because this will get used in the next part of the talk. Maybe I better go back. It turns out that finding the central configurations is the same as finding the critical points for this function. What's u? I better write down a formula for u. u is g. It's the potential for the end body problem. 
It's actually the negative of the potential. The potential is a strictly negative function. This is the negative of the potential. So you take G times the product of the masses divided by the distances and sum it over the, dis the pairs, a, the distinct pairs A, B. And now this thing is homogeneous of degree minus one. I will uh, talk about this, this uh, function later, but this is homogeneous of degree one. This whole thing now is invariant under scaling and uh, rotations and translations. And what that boils down to meaning is that it's a, um, a function on complex projective n minus two space. And the critical points of that function are exactly the central configurations. So Morse theory starts being relevant. Again, the critical points of this function are the central configurations. And I want to, I want to draw a picture of, of that when n is three. So this is the picture of that uh, normalized potential for the three body problem. This, this is a binary collision. So the, this, this funny function has a pole there. These saddle points are the Euler points. There's three of them, three Euler points. You can kind of see them there. And there's the Lagrange points. So the critical points of this function on CP three minus two, which is CP one, which is S two, the critical points of that function are the central configurations. Here's another picture of this thing I call the shape sphere, <clears throat> which will play a big role momentarily. So the shape sphere is a way of looking at the quotient of the configuration space by the Galilean group. The center, the shape sphere has as its center, so it's not in the shape sphere, it's the center. This is triple collision. So all the bodies have collided. Out of triple collision comes the three binary collisions where those, where those poles were. And then the critical points are the three Euler points on the equator, the equator is a set of collinear or degenerate triangles, and there's the equilateral triangle. So this gives you a little picture of the central configurations and how they fit into the three-body problem. And, and I'm going to jump ship, and I'm going to go to the fourth problem with the remaining time. So the fourth problem is is the image of the scattering map open and dense? And the person who got me into this problem is Andreas Kanau from um, Nuremberg. And uh, we're, we, we have one paper with Jacques Fajos and we're about to finish another one. And then Nathan Doignan, who was a student of Holger Dolan, and Rick Mokel and Gu Wei Yu, and I have another paper. So I'm going to discuss that work and um, what it has to do with this open problem. So let's, here's again that picture we saw of um, Kepler scattering. And here it is for a uh, positive. This is now repulsive force. This is the uh, Rutherford, excuse me, I'm gonna get a drink of water. This is the uh, Rutherford scattering. For Rutherford, the red dot was a gold nucleus, and these guys were alpha particles, stripped helium. And um, this repulsion is what led him to posit the existence of a nucleus inside of every atom. But he he analyzed the classical problem to analyze experimental data. So I wrote here, essential in discovering the existence of the nucleus and the proton. <clears throat> so I want you to think of this incoming beam. It's, it's a, and I want you to think of a cross section and I'm going to label these rays by a parameter B. 
And then I'm going to surround the nucleus by a circle. And these bees are going to come in and they're going to go out in some direction. And when I do that, I get a scattering map. The, the parameter B here is called the impact parameter. And these are the, the these uh, final outgoing directions is what they get mapped to. And because the Kepler problem is exactly solvable, you can you can write down what happens to B. An incoming B tells what the meaning of B is if you turned off the central force, B tells you how much the how close the line gets to the nucleus if you turned off the central force. So that, that's the impact parameter. And here's an explicit expression for this scattering map. You input a given B and the output is how far the angle has, has how, how far the ray has deflected. And it's gonna be important for us that when B goes to infinity, the, the line doesn't get deflected at all. So, th so that's the Coulomb uh, or, or, or Kepler scattering. And I want to underline here that I put a dashed arrow here. And the reason is because the domain of this map is a priori not the whole line because you have collision orbits, orbits that are coming right in to the central attracting or repulsing force. Let me pause for a moment and, and see if there's any questions yet in the audience. So I suppose it's the same for Kepler, this map, or is it different? I mean, for the Except factor. For the, right? oh, the only difference is the sign of Z. So right, Z is positive or negative. That's the only, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. It's exactly the same. So this, what they call the differential cross-section for Kepler and for Rutherford, for, for repulsive or attractive, the differential cross-section is exactly the same. I learned this from the book of Knauf. Knauf has a nice book on, uh, on uh, classical mechanics, originally written in German and he's translated, it's been translated to English. <clears throat> Let me tell you a few things about this particular map. If you can take the continuous limit, either for the repulsive or attractive case, as you go to B equals zero, B equals zero is when you go right into collision. If you took the continuous limit, the orbit would bounce right back. So it would come in and bounce back. So it turns out the map actually extends to B equals zero. And what it tells you to do is just bounce off the central attracting or repulsing sun and just go back the way you came. And the result is the map is a degree one map. Oh, so I forgot to say here, I'm gonna use that R union infinity is the circle. So that's what, this, that's what this circle is. It's the compactified line. So I add B equal infinity in and I get a circle. So I get a map from the circle to itself and its degree is either one or minus one. So that's a, a wonderful fact that, that Knauf underlines. And, and basically his philosophy is degree is topologically stable. So, so this phenomena somehow ought to extend to more bodies, any dimension, because degree, being degree one is a topologically stable phenomena. So a few, um, a few um, other uh, observations of Knauf. If you replace the one over R potential, the minus one over R potential by minus one over R to a power A, the scattering map will extend continuously through the collision value if and only if A is of a particular type. 
two n over n plus one, where n is an integer. Um, I'm just realizing something's, let's see, what happened? Yeah, right. So n is going to be two to get Kepler. So basically what happens for these different values of A is the way you can, you can complicit, you can explicitly compute everything. These are central forces. What the way you think of it is as your, as your beam comes in, when A is anything but one of these special values, total collision kind of shreds the beam up and makes it discontinuous. So I will let you um, either look at Knauf's paper, it's from 1999, or work it out yourself. You could work it out using Landau and Lifshitz central configuration stuff. I, I have Another, a quick question. Yeah, please. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know if you said something and I missed it, but, but this depends on the energy somehow, I think, right? Or am I missing? So uh, it should, let me see if I left that out. Yeah, there's the energy. Oh, there's the energy. energy. Okay, okay, I, I understand. There's the energy right. right there. See it? Great. Yeah, that makes lots of sense. Thanks a lot. Yep. Who who was that? Uh, this is Jeff Vassell. Um, Hi, Jeff. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah, the energy's there, and this is well, really well uh, derived and explained in Knauf's book. Yes, the energy's there. Thank you. Okay, the second, the second. Um, uh, I guess. Sorry, one. So, the, yeah. The, go ahead. The the, the uh, conclusion right is if the energy is too small, that is undefined. That expression. Yeah, if the energy is negative it, or even zero, it it doesn't right. work because everything will be bound. Yeah. yeah, energy has to be positive right. for this to work. Great. <clears throat> okay, the second remark Knauf makes is. Since Kepler is rotationally invariant, the same thing works in any dimension, any dimension Kepler problem. <clears throat> so what I mean by uh, any dimensional Kepler problem is Q double dot is minus a constant Q over norm Q cubed, where Q is an R to the M plus one. And you'll get a map from the sphere to the sphere. And, it, and it'll look the same as that Kepler problem that I wrote down in every plane <clears throat> because of rotational invariance. <clears throat> okay, so I've got about 10, what, just five minutes left or 10 minutes left, Sean? Five to 10. All right. I didn't get very far. I should have just skipped central configurations, but here we go. Okay. So what's so now I want to do three body Newtonian scattering. And the big difference is it's anisotropic. Unlike Coulomb or Rutherford, different incoming beam directions will lead to different scattering maps. And what's a beam direction? It's a unit vector in the configuration space. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a map depending on the incoming beam direction. And when n is three and d is four, the configuration space is four dimensional. The sphere is three dimensional. We expect to get a map from S3 to S3. I remind you the broken arrow means the domain of the map is, we don't expect it to be the whole sphere. So here's a picture again of the shape sphere. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot in a Lagrange beam. So I'm going to shoot in a beam of electro equilateral triangles. They're going to come in, they're going to interact, and they're going to go out. The energy is going to be positive, which guarantees that most of the orbits go back out to infinity. Here is a picture of the resulting scattering. And, and this picture is in the disk. Why the disk? It's just easier to draw the disk. The disk is the same thing as the shape sphere modulo reflection. So I'm gonna call it the shape disk. It's a quotient of three body configuration space minus triple collision 
by all isometries. In this picture up here, I was just modding out by orientation preserving isometries. So I mod out by all isometries, including reflections and, and scaling. And what I get when I do that is I get the quotient of this shape sphere by reflection about the equator. So I call it the, the shape disk. And in this picture, the Lagrange orbit is the center of the disk and the boundary of the disk is the set of collinear triangles. So these are degenerate triangles. And this is a whole bunch of Lagrange triangles coming in and what happens as they go out again. And here's an animation of it that Rick Mokel made. So they come out, they move around and they settle down. And then the pattern, I, it's just a loop. So the pattern repeats. So he did, he, scat, he looked at scattering of a whole bunch of Lagrange triangles. And this is the picture he got. And the colors indicate how close you are to infinity. So black are orbits that the distances of the three bodies never, in the three bodies never get close. Blue is they get closer, green is closer, and red is even closer. So we want to understand these pictures. And um, the, the distribution of the dots suggests that um, the scattering map is onto. You've covered the entire shape disk by these dots. So the computer graphics, the numerics suggest that the answer to my question is that the scattering map is onto, but I haven't defined the scattering map yet. <clears throat> so I'm going to now start to try. So I'm not gonna get very far. I'm not gonna get to the end of the talk, but I'm gonna at least try to, to get you close. I'm going to start to try to define the scattering map and then say what we know about it. So how are we gonna generalize from Kepler? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so M plus one is the dimension of the configuration space. So a sphere in the configuration space is gonna be M dimensional. Um, and my beam, my Lagrange beam, if you will, is an m-dimensional space of rays in the n-body configuration space coming in, and then they interact, and then they go out again. But this going out now is in the full configuration space. So she, she should think of this sphere as an SM. And we'll find that infinity in the B space and the impact parameter space infinity, if you're, if you're at infinity in the B space, you basically don't interact, which means that the incoming direction is the same as the outgoing direction. So infinity goes to the out, so the infinity, where did, did I put it here? Uh, I didn't put it here. Infinity is going to want to go to V minus the incoming beam direction. So you can co compactify this space of impact parameters. And if you do things right, you ought to get a map from again, a sphere to a sphere. And if life were nice, this would be a degree one map, which would mean it'd be on to. But because of collisions, we can't tell you, the map's actually not defined everywhere. If this map were actually defined everywhere, it would almost certainly be degree one like Kepler. And I could just say, oh, the map is onto and I would have answered my question. But because of collisions, I can't do that. Uh, so here's the scattering map again. And it's a map from impact parameters to outgoing directions. It's a map from an RM to an outgoing sphere. It should take infinity to V minus. And uh, so if you compactify the sphere, it ought to be a map from a sphere to a sphere. 
And the question I'm asking is, is the map almost onto? In other words, is its image open and dense? So we believe that the answer is yes, but we don't know. So there, if I had another half hour, which I don't, <laughs> sorry, I didn't parse my time well, um, I would talk a little bit, I would talk for a bit more about this first problem, how do you define the scattering map? And then the theorem, so the open question is, is the image of the map open and dense? And the theorem that we have, we don't have a theorem that says yes, but we do have a, we are able to define it for any fixed incoming beam direction. And we can tell you that the map is real analytic and its image has a non-empty interior, but we don't know if it's on to. Um, and I think I'm out of time, but I'll, I'll just end with this little snippet from 1922. Um, Shazi wrote down the asymptotics for these, um, these type of uh, orbits, these positive energy orbits, and they look like this. Q of T is A of T. And now here's a, a big, very uh, pesky, complicated surprise. F A of T minus F A log T. F A is the force of Newton's equations plus B plus O1 plus order. In other words, something that decays with time. So this is as time goes to infinity. This is like your incoming velocity or outgoing velocity. This is like your impact parameter. And we want to think of um, the A and the B as initial conditions at infinity. So a lot of our work boils down to kind of figuring out how to think of these things as initial conditions at infinity. And I think I'm basically out of time. Is that right, Sean? Yeah, about. So I'm gonna stop before I get to the end and I'm just gonna let people ask questions as they will, cause I, yeah. So just go ahead, ask questions. I can either keep going with the talk or you can ask questions. <laughs>